What's the highest energy a photon can have? Is Titan just a huge fire hazard floating in space? How do they measure the masses of planets with just satellites? And Q&A Plus, what realistic sci-fi is worth watching? All this and more in this question show. It's time for the question show. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are across my channel. If a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them up and I'll answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Mars chart, is oxygen a flammable gas on Titan? Yeah, pretty much. So, you know, Titan has various hydrocarbons that will gladly burn. The thing that's missing then is the oxygen. And so if you wanted to start a fire on Titan, you would have to bring the oxygen to keep the fire going. FPL Mikkel, is there any other place in space that we know of where you can light fire? A lack of ability to light fire seems to be the most likely great filter to me for intelligent life. So this is a theory that has been proposed. The gist is that any civilization that that arises on a planet that doesn't have a minimum level of oxygen, like we're at 21% oxygen in the atmosphere. And so there's like a minimum level of oxygen where you just can't light a fire. 16 is the minimum. And if you couldn't light a fire, then you couldn't have technology. And so there could be whole civilizations that live on worlds where the oxygen level is so low that fires don't start. And it just never even occurs to them to have that kind of technology. The fires, you know, just aren't a thing, which is sort of an interesting idea. So yeah, I mean, it wouldn't explain the great filter because, you know, we know that there are planets that would have that level of oxygen, but it would explain why some civilization wouldn't be able to progress because they just couldn't light fires. Darth EX0, a lot of people refer to stars as burning. Is this technically correct? Shouldn't we say fusing? Sure. Like if you want to be really technically correct, you would say that it is fusion. But you know, it's just a word that makes sense. You know, it's not a fire. We just call it burning. Francois Miron, is there a minimum mass for a gravitational lensing phenomena? Could Jupiter have the mass to be a lens? So like, I'm sure there is a minimum where the amount of deflection that you get from the mass of the object is too small to really help like how much of a gravitational lens could a human being be you know, you're producing gravity, you're distorting photons a tiny little bit. But the problem with Jupiter is that it doesn't have enough mass. And so you would have to go dramatically farther away, light years away before you could use Jupiter as a gravitational lens in the way you could use the sun. The sun is a better lens because its gravity is stronger. The sun is 99.8% the mass of the solar system. And so you know, Jupiter is is the rest. And so unfortunately, you really wouldn't be able to use Jupiter and then and Jupiter would be the best of the worst options. But but no, the sun is really the only option we've got if we had a black hole here in the in the solar system, that would be the best. But that would have problems of its own. Michael McConnell, can you explain how gravity is measured from satellites and how they could be so precise? Thanks. Sure. So the the way you measure the gravity of an object or really the mass of an object is that you measure how things go in orbit around it. And the roughest way to do that is to use like a moon, you just look watch how a moon is going around a planet. And that allows you to calculate the mass of the moon that the amount of time it takes for the moon to orbit around the planet, and the distance from the moon to the planet tells you the mass of the planet and also can tell you the mass of the moon. If you can detect the oscillations. Anyway, there are other ways that you can do it as well. And the most accurate way the gold standard is to put an orbiter into orbit around the planet. And then you measure the signals coming to and from that spacecraft. And so every planet has a geode believe is the term. Um, but it's essentially the shape of its gravity well, that there are regions around the Earth that are higher and lower density. And that um, those regions of higher and lower density change the amount of gravity that is leaking out into space. And so if you look at this sort of gravitational diagram of like the Earth or the moon, there are these really cool animations of, of what it looks like. And so once you have an orbiter in orbit around the planet, and it's made enough orbits, then you can sort of calculate the shape of the of the gravity field of that object. And there have been some even like really, really accurate measurements of the Earth's gravity, there were multiple spacecraft that would fly in formation, and they would fire a laser in between them. And then as they passed over regions of higher and lower gravity, they would drift 
farther apart from each other and then come back together. And they were able to measure this distance from each other. And by doing so, astronomers or geologists, I guess, were able to map the, the shape of the Earth's gravity field with incredible accuracy. So the short answer is put a satellite into orbit around a world that you want to measure its gravity, and then communicate with it on a regular basis to sort of measure its position and that will help you figure out the gravity. It's time to shout out our new patrons at the $5 level and above. Dwayne Clare, Jerry Zach, Ian Bell, Deb Delasio, Christian Siegert, T.S. Kelso, Tachyonic Sloth, Bob White, Ben Rabu, and Brian Quinn. Join our community at patreon.com slash universe today. Colin Houseworth, what is the wavelength limit for high energy photons? There is no limit to how small the wavelengths can be. You know, you go radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible light, uh, ultraviolet, X rays, gamma rays. And so the wavelengths are getting smaller and smaller and smaller as you move up to that part. And with gamma rays, the wavelengths can just get smaller and smaller and smaller forever, depending on how energetic the photon is when it's released, there is no limit. Now I'm sure there is a practical limit, there is the the most energetic photon that's ever been released in the universe. Um, and I don't know what that is. Um, I know there's like 511 kilo electron volts that are coming from uh, magnetars at the center of the Milky Way, you know, they're pretty small, but I don't know what is the sort of most energetic photon, which will also be the smallest wavelength. I don't know if the Planck length is the absolute actual limit. So, um, you know, the Planck length isn't necessarily it might be the lowest measurable limit, but it's not like the the resolution of the universe. Encoded PR, would you take a trip to a moon base? Yeah, like if it was safe, if I knew that it was safe, um, I would totally take a trip to a moon base. That'd be great. Like I would take a trip to orbit. Uh, if it was safe, and it was free, I would do that. Um, and same thing if it was, you know, if I could go to the moon, like I would, if I had to choose between going to the moon and going to orbit, I'd probably take the moon. That would be really cool to experience being in lower gravity, to be able to look up into the sky and see the Earth, be able to go on walks around in the environment. It's so alien from what we have on, on Earth. You know, right now, it's taking an enormous amount of technology and funds to be able to pay for a couple of people to set foot on the surface of the moon, whether it's the Chinese or whether it's the Americans or some other upcoming collaboration or paying customers at SpaceX. But, uh, but yeah, it would it'll be amazing if we have some far future where you can actually go to the moon, pop off to the moon. Annie Alexander, when I was watching For All Mankind, I had this weird feeling that our reality was the alt history and the show's version of the history was the real one. Yeah, um, For All Mankind messes with your head because they did such a good job of telling the history of the space program as it was back in the 1960s and the early 70s except at the beginning of For All Mankind, it's the Soviets that set foot on the moon first. And that begins this new space race or begins the space race, as the Americans and the Soviets are continuing to race to try to build a base on the moon and then eventually send the first humans to Mars and all of the complications that go with that. Um, and it's in my top five space related shows. So if you're looking for you know, a great show, I highly recommend for all mankind. But it's weird. It's like the attention to detail. If you watch at the very end of the first season of for all mankind, they have and it's just like it's buried in the credits of the first season, they're launching a sea dragon, which is this weird, obscure, you know it if you know it, uh, insider speculative rocket that was designed back in the 1970s or 60s that would launch heavy payloads to the moon and then they're showing you one launch. It's a rocket that's in the ocean and launches out of the water. It's so cool. And then they had the space shuttle going to the moon. Um, and then they, they started building nuclear rockets and all this was done at you know, in the 70s and 80s. And uh, yeah, yeah, it makes you sad. I mean, you know, who knows how realistic it is, but it sort of makes you sad that, that that's the future that we could have had, if we'd kept going, just 
kept investing in space, even though it was hard, even though it was expensive, even though it was dangerous, that we knew that that was that's the future of humanity. And so you just keep going as opposed to you set foot on the moon and then you call it a day because you know, mission accomplished. Did you know that you can watch the same video with no ads and get a bonus question over on Patreon completely for free? We call it Q&A plus and this week's bonus question, what realistic sci fi is worth watching? And I'll put a link in the show notes. All right, those are all the questions that we had this week. Thank you everyone who asked your questions in the YouTube comments, and everybody who participated in the live show. Now, this is we're in the last week of showing bits and pieces of previous live shows. But we have already begun the new season of the live shows, which we record every Monday at 5pm. Now the time changes. So we just completed the one at 5pm Pacific time. So we're going to rotate. And next week, we're going to be at 5pm, uh, but in Europe time. So definitely check the the channel here and you'll see the the time. So if you live in Europe, then it'll be a much better time in your evening, you'll be able to watch the live stream. I'm going to talk about uh, AI slop again. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Barely Griffin, Brian Body, Caridwin, Chuck Hawkins, Commander Bailock, Cy Nelson, Dave Verabioff, David Gilton, and David Matz, Evan Pro, Greg Feely, Hudson Moore, James Clark, Jeremy Madden, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Marcel Schultz, Michael Purcell, Modso, Paul Robach, Ren Kaidu, Richard Williams, Sean Sargent, Stephen Fallon Munley, Vlad Shiplin, and Wolfgang Klotz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. And all our patrons, all your support means the universe to us. So we just posted last week's Space Bites where we talked about Comet 3i Atlas. And for some reason, our video went viral ish on YouTube. And we got a couple of 100,000 people watch the video, which was great and amazing, and brought in a bunch of new people. And the thing that shocked and surprised me was a significant percentage of the people, their comment was, Oh, wow, this isn't an AI voice. This is an actual human being, which is scary. Right? Like, like, just think about how many people are going onto YouTube, they're, I don't know, updating their homepage, letting the algorithm show them various stuff, they're interested in space and science. And now YouTube is starting to put them on the AI slop train. And you can do this experiment yourself, do a search on YouTube for Comet 3i Atlas, sort by newest first, and you will just get slop after slop, spam after spam, do a search and don't sort it by date, and you will get a bunch of spam and slop and they will get many more views than any that I get on my video. And that's just because they have crafted the perfect thumbnail, they've got the perfect title, they are making something kind of threatening or scary or pseudosciencey or whatever. And it is causing people to click and then when they watch the video, it's just jibber jabber from AI slop and it is not adding any value at all. And somebody is walking away with lots of money and YouTube is just it's just happening, whatever. And I think, you know, when that high of a percentage of people are relieved, so relieved, when they find a channel that actually has a human being who is actually just creating stuff and making content, you know, like they did in your grandfather's day, did journalism, called people, reported on stories, and then shared what they've discovered with an audience, um, they're shocked and relieved. And this cannot be good for YouTube. So if anybody from YouTube is watching this, please, please deal with this. You are destroying your reputation, you are just throwing it in the toilet. And that after a while, if you let this keep going, then YouTube itself will not be the kind of place that people are going to want to spend any time on because it is mostly just garbage. So, you know, we're seeing the beginnings of this. I think we know where this goes, where the incentives are. Uh, definitely make sure that you subscribe to the channels that you like, the ones who are definitely real and are human beings creating things for human beings and subscribe to their channel and then access your list of subscribe channels from the subscriptions tab on the side of YouTube. Don't just keep updating, reloading the homepage and hoping that the slop is going to go away. It's just going to be more of it. All right, we'll see you next time.